Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts always be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Um, two things. First off, um, one, um, if uh, you were ever tempted to think that our 90-minute Sunday services are too long, um, keep in mind Nehemiah 9 was a half a day, okay? Uh, <clears throat> okay, just keep that in mind. Two, it seems almost criminal of me uh, not to preach on Nehemiah 9 after what Nehemiah 9 put David through. <laughs> But nevertheless, if you would, please open a Bible to John 10. <laughs> maybe, we'll get to, maybe we'll get to it. I don't know. Who knows? As you may know, if you're a church nerd, or as you may have gathered, um, from all the sheep in shepherding language today, we had it in the collect at the beginning, we had it in the psalm, we had it in the epistle from Peter and in John's gospel. Today is traditionally nicknamed Good Shepherd Sunday. Of course, our gospel reading from John 10 stops right before Jesus says, I am the good shepherd in verse 11. That's for next year, according to our nearly inspired lectionary of week (laughs) readings. So no good shepherd Sunday for you this year. eh? This year, it's door of the sheep pen Sunday, eh? which speaking as a former marketer, just doesn't quite have the same pizzazz to use a technical term. But um, be that as it may, in all this talk about sheep and shepherds and sheep pen, it's important to recognize that what's indeed in John 10, Jesus is really working with two different metaphors or analogies for himself in that chapter. Um, There's the better known one, of course, of the good shepherd analogy, which immediately follows our reading, as I mentioned, and which you'll get to hear next year, as I mentioned. So I'm not going to read it now because I, I don't want to spoil all the anticipation and excitement for next year. But it's the analogy wherein Jesus is the good shepherd who knows his own sheep and they know him who lays down his life for his sheep, unlike the hired hand who will run when the wolves show up. And that's the analogy that resonates so well with our other readings. It clearly resonates a bit more easily with Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It also resonates really well with the ending of our reading from 1 Peter, For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Now, that Nehemiah reading, that's, you know, that's a bit out of left field in all this. But still, but still, maybe we'll pull that in before before we're over. But anyway, all that's to say that that analogy, however, is not the one with which Jesus begins in John 10, and which is our reading this morning. Let's look at verse 7 of John 10. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. That's the analogy we're given in our reading. That's the analogy that Jesus begins this whole sheep-filled discourse with. The idea that Jesus can somehow be understood, in a sense, as a metaphorical door to a metaphorical pen that keeps all us metaphorical sheep safe. So that's the first thing to note here. Jesus identifies himself as a door to some kind of place of shelter and safety. Now, the second thing to note is that this particular I am declaration, you know, John's very fond of I am declarations, and this one's I am the door of the sheep, stands, strangely enough, in the middle of our passage, right? The I am the good shepherd declaration, verse 11, it actually kind of begins its own particular train of thought. But here, verse 7, I am the door of the sheep, is bridging two different but very related perspectives on this Jesus as door analogy. Although, to be fair, they kind of blur a bit, as we'll see. First, what Jesus declares in verse 7 about himself follows in what he has just said in verses 1 through 5. So look at verse 6. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. In other words, what Jesus was saying in verses 1 through 5, what the English translation of verse 6 calls a figure of speech which is really not a great translation, because if you think about it, five verses is a pretty darn long figure of speech, right? But, you know, truth is, translators just didn't know what to do with that word in Greek, which probably means something like proverb or parable, but not quite, because whatever Jesus is doing doesn't seem like a proverb, doesn't really seem like a parable. So it's more like verse 6 is talking in terms of, like, this extended analogy that Jesus used with them, but that doesn't That doesn't sound very good. So anyway, you get the idea, basically. The point is, the people are listening to all this, 
right? Which if you skim ahead, which if you skim back up to John 9 a little bit and you look just at the end, you'll see that this crowd of people listening to him include a whole bunch of Pharisees, right? So keep that in mind. The point is that the people listening to all this don't understand what he's saying. And so at this point, in order to clarify things, Jesus says, I am the door of the sheep, which to my thinking probably didn't clarify anything, but still, <laughs> still I'm guessing Jesus doesn't need preaching tips from me. So what is Jesus getting at in verses one through five? Well, let's look at verse one. Jesus said, truly, truly, or in the Greek, amen, amen. I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. Pause there. Now, at first whiff, there's nothing immediately profound here in what Jesus is saying, right? He's basically just, he's kind of just stating the obvious. If you're the shepherd, you don't got to climb the walls to get to the sheep. You go through the front door. The gatekeeper knows you. You don't need no stinking badges. You just walk right in, right? It is right and proper for you to enter, for you to be there with the sheep. On the other hand, that gatekeeper ain't going to let in thieves and robbers through the front door. So they're going to have to scale the walls in order to break into where they're not supposed to be. Utterly mundane and obvious stuff. No wonder those listening are kind of scratching their heads by the time verse 6 rolls around. But now, impose the meaning of verse 7 on the analogy that Jesus is that door through which that shepherd goes to the sheep. And then also recollect, not only are there Pharisees in the crowd, but also that Jesus has just finished savaging those Pharisees, okay? Because look back up in John 9, if you've got your Bibles open. John 9, 39 and following. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who, may, who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard those things and said to him, Are we also blind? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, We see, your guilt remains. Ooh, burn, right? Now, all of that is following out of the story of Jesus as having healed this man born blind, which we spent some time with a few weeks back. And you might remember that the bulk of that story isn't really about healing, right? It's really about all the Pharisees and the religious leaderships refusing to see the obvious in a sense, right? The fact that Jesus must be from God. And so it's that context of judgment over the willful, obstinate blindness of the Jewish religious leadership concerning Jesus that leads into our reading, into the seemingly mundane description of how shepherds go to work in the morning. But you combine that context of judgment up with what Jesus says in verse 7, that he is the, that door of the sheep, and now we're in a position to see what Jesus is talking about. Faithful teachers versus false teachers. Or more to the point, teachers who go through, who pass through, whose teaching comes through the door, that is, through Jesus, and teachers who have to scramble over the walls, as it were, false teachers, right, who attempt to get to the flock by some means other than Jesus. And I want to get into what such other means might actually look like and how they're always disastrous. But for the moment, let's finish up this first part. Continue with verse 3. To him, the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Now, it's interesting. That's actually a pretty accurate description of Middle Eastern sheep herding. Not that I personally know a lot about sheep herding, let alone Middle Eastern sheep herding, but I have it on good report, let's say, right? I have it on good report that this stuff is actually true, that shepherds have individual calls for individual sheep, and the sheep know sheep, that is not a word, individual sheep, right? And sheep know them. Even if a stranger tries to imitate the call, sheep just know the difference. In fact, if two shepherds have combined their flocks for a time, they can easily sort them all out when they want to part ways. One shepherd simply calls his sheep to himself, and one by one, the sheep will start wandering over to him. And speaking as a preacher, it's just kind of amazing that Jesus has such a perfect sermon illustration from the world to work with, which seems, as a preacher, just a little unfair since he created that world. But <laughs> no matter. <coughs> Because what Jesus is getting at is the fact that his sheep will recognize the call of their shepherd versus the voice of a stranger or a thief or a robber. And the shepherd he's talking about 
is actually not the good shepherd, not Jesus himself. Not yet. That's coming verse 11 next year, right? You have to wait. Jesus is just the door here. And so in view are still teachers, shepherds who come through the door, teachers who teach Jesus versus thieves and robbers who will come over the walls, false teachers who teach something else. And the sheep, Jesus' point is, know the difference. Now, as a matter of experience, as a matter of boots on the ground reality, I'm not so sure that's necessarily true, right? I'm not so sure that we always know the difference between shepherds and thieves and robbers. But taken in context, right? Jesus is talking about what has just happened in the previous chapter in John 9. As you might remember, the man born blind is healed of his physical blindness right at the beginning of the story. And the rest of the story is just this tale of how the Jewish religious leadership willingly becomes spiritually blinder and blinder to who Jesus is, while the healed man comes to see more and more clearly exactly who Jesus is and ultimately comes to follow him. In other words, that man born blind, he's a type of sheep who has fled from the voices of the, stranger, of the strangers, of the thieves and robbers, because he has come, he knows, or he's come to know, the voice of the shepherd. He's come to know the difference. And that's the image here. Sheep who know or are coming to know what a shepherd, someone who comes through the door, through Jesus, sounds like. Someone who can tell the difference between true teaching and false teaching, between Jesus and something else. And it's on those sheep that what follows out of that what follows out of Jesus' verse seven. Uh, uh, let's start that over, and it's those sheep, right, that Jesus is focusing on as he flows as it flows out of his I am declaration in verse seven, because it's not just shepherds who pass through that door, it's the sheep themselves. Verse eight and following, all who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Now, commentaries get a little nervous here. Obviously, they say, Jesus can't mean that all who came before him are thieves and robbers. Because wouldn't that include Moses and all the prophets? That seems a bit sus, right? Jesus wouldn't diss Moses and the prophets like that. And so, you'll often get the commentators will often soften it a bit. Jesus is talking about just the false religious leadership, obviously not Old Testament prophets. Or maybe he's talking about other people before him claiming to be the Messiah. But the thing is, Jesus is kind of clear here. All who came before me. So maybe what he's getting at is the idea that compared to him or without him in view, <clears throat> all ultimately are thieves and robbers. All can be transformed into thieves and robbers of a sort. Because if you think about it, the Pharisees who are rejecting Jesus, they have Moses and the prophets, but in their hands, apart from Jesus, without understanding that Moses and the prophets all ultimately speak about Jesus, in their hands, Moses and the prophets can become thieves and robbers. But Jesus goes on to say, the sheep, his sheep, as figured by that man born blind whose eyes are increasingly open to Jesus, his sheep don't listen to the thieves and robbers because his sheep have found him. They've come through the door and through him, through the door, they have found safety. They have found pasture. In other words, what the analogy is getting at overall is that, is that sheep who have come through the door, who have come to know Jesus, will also know the difference between shepherds, teachers, who have also come through that door, and thieves, robbers, false teachers who don't. Or at least that's the idea. That's the hope. Like I said, I'm not 100% sure that's completely true in practice or in reality, because it's extraordinarily easy, even for someone committed to Jesus, to, to keep Jesus' analogy going, to want to find a side entrance to the sheep pen, right? A side entrance to where you can feel safe and secure, right? To your pastors, to add a turnstile even, or something extra to the front of the door. In other words, it's really, really tempting to make it about Jesus and, or Jesus or, or Jesus and or something else. Now, if you're regular here, you know that at least once a month, I have to bring up this one quote from the great 20th century theologian Karl Barth. If you know it, I'm sorry, but if you don't, basically at the end of a long career, Barth was asked to sum up his understanding of theology in a sentence, right? A lifelong career of one of the greatest theologians ever who wrote what is probably the longest systematic theology in all church history, said, what is it in a sentence? And he replied, 
Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. <laughs> now, he's obviously just quoting a cute children's rhyme, which just seems very quaint at first glance. And yet, no, nevertheless, if you know Bart at all, and I'm sure you all have his first 14 volume church dogmatics <laughs> sitting on your nightstands, if you know Bart's theology at all, you know that that pithy little children's rhyme actually is a pretty good summary of Bart's thoughts. So here's the deal. Bart was a professor of theology in Germany in the 1930s, right? And you can probably start to do the math on that. He's teaching theology in the midst of the rise of Hitler and Nazism. And during this time, there was exceptional pressure on churches to merge the ideals of this rising national socialism into the faith of the church, to see, in essence, national socialism, Nazism, as something of a national, cultural, political revelation, if you will, in the meteor meteoric rise of Adolf Hitler, in the groundswell of German nationalism and revitalization, in this feverish imagining and embracing of almost what was a kind of revealed destiny of the German folk, right? And many in the German ev in evangelical church went along with it, right? Many out of fear, to be sure, many out of pressure, to be sure, but many quite enthusiastically. For many, this was great stuff. But Bart, along with a number of German theologians and clergy, would have none of it. In fact, in 1934, he was the chief author of something called the Barman Declaration, which was basically a declaration by a bunch of pastors that essentially said, there is no Fuhrer but Jesus, and there is no source of revelation but Scripture. Now, not surprisingly, this didn't win Bart many friends in the Reich, right? And he was forced to resign his professorship at the University of Bonn the very next year and returned to his native Switzerland, where, as an aside, the paperwork for his new professorship at the University of Basel asked him if he supported the national defense. And he replied, yes, especially on our northern border. <laughs> Exclamation points. But I digress. The point is, Bart didn't actually see this moment, this temptation to bring the ideology of Nazism alongside Jesus as an isolated thing, as an unusual thing. On the contrary, he saw it as the norm, this human tendency to always want to take some other revelation, some other truth, some other seeming good that we have discerned and put it alongside Scripture's revelation of Jesus. In fact, Bart tends to refer to that tendency as natural theology, the thinking about God and what is good that we tend to do naturally, that just naturally tends to occur to us. The revelations we have on our own, apart from God, that is, apart from God's revelation to us in Scripture. And what Bart says is that, is that things, that, is that the things our natural theology imagines that we want to elevate like that, they always pretend at first that they just want to be an also. But they always intend, eventually, inevitably, to be an only. That is, our inventions always want to be usurpers of God. In other words, it starts off with Jesus and and whatever that good thing is, Jesus and the German destiny, right, in this case. But due to the human heart being what it is, the other thing always aims for that position at the top alone. This is what Bart writes. The history of proclamation and theology is simply a history of the wearisome conflict of the church with the fact that the also demanded really meant an only. He describes those other things as like Trojan horses, if you remember that from the Ili or from Greek myth, right? Loaded, unbeknownst with the enemy, who are going to climb out in the night and take the city of our faith from the inside out. And it happens all the time, Bart says. He writes, exactly the same thing happened at the beginning of the 18th century with the reviving humanism, or a century later with idealism, or in its train with romanticism, and then with positivism and nationalism, and a little later with socialism. They had all wanted to have their say in the church. In other words, to bring it back to our reading, the whole history of the church has been a long history of folks trying to figure out ways over the wall, ways to take what they believe and hold dear over the wall into the sheep pen, such that the sheep gradually begin to lose sight of the door. And it began, frankly, long before the church. It's frankly, if we were to keep reading in Nehemiah, which I'm sure David is glad we didn't do, if we kept reading in Nehemiah, it would, it would actually show us, right? I told you we'd work that in, right? Because what that reading shows us is a group of exiles now newly returned from, to Jerusalem from Babylon, reminding themselves essentially how they get exiled in the first place. 
right? Because, and this was what our reading focused on, God treated them over and over and over again in so many ways with such abundant goodness and grace and mercy. And then what our reading didn't include, that God's people repaid God over and over and over again in so many ways and forms by completely forgetting him and worshiping something else. And it never happens suddenly. It never happens in a vacuum. It happens in the same way that Barth is describing. What also seems good gets added to what God has done, to what God has said, and eventually allows you to push what God has done, what God has said, off to the side. For Israel, it was certain modes of worship that all their neighbors did that seemed to work, that seemed to bring rain or victory in battle or whatever, and seemed harmless enough, a little extra something, a little hedging your bets, but eventually replaced God entirely. For Bart, obviously, it was national socialism. And he saw the writing on the wall that the fervor of Nazism would quickly transform Christianity into something that was no longer about Jesus anymore. And you can see it happening today, because it always happens. You can see it happening in our politics. In churches more on the political left, you have wokeism and critical theory creeping alongside the gospel, right? Presenting themselves as values, values which the proponents believe are good values, even best values, right? That also need to be proclaimed. But of course, as Bart said, the nature of these things is always towards becoming the only thing that needs to be proclaimed. And it's on the right too, right? There's no immunity there. It's that temptation to take the highest and best of, our, of other things that we have, that we hold near, de dear, and bring them alongside Jesus. And so what it's going to be on the right, typically nationalism, patriotism, conservative cultural values, that kind of thing. Strangely, as a bit of an aside, the most outspoken example I ever knew on the political right was a Canadian. <laughs> he was a Canadian Pentecostal whose beliefs, core beliefs, included the idea that America was the divine sword of the Lord in the world. And I just remember thinking, dude, you're a Canadian, right? <laughs> Can you even say that? I mean... I get that Canada probably ain't going to check a whole heck of a lot of boxes as a possible sword of the Lord in the, God's divine plan, right? But, you know, have a little national pride. Maybe Canada's the little dagger of destiny or something. I don't know. <laughs> but I digress. What's at stake is this idea of Jesus and a political entity. Jesus and a cultural value system. Jesus and something, however truly good. Or take, for instance, the Pharisees that Jesus is talking to in our reading. For them, that something else is the law. For them, it's literally God's word, and it doesn't get much better than that, right? Go back up at some point, not now. Go back up and reread John 9, where the Pharisees are wrangling and debating about how a sinner like Jesus, who breaks the Sabbath for crying out loud, could possibly do a miracle like heal a man born blind. In their case, they've taken Scripture which is fundamentally all about God, which if they could just see, if they could just open their eyes, which if they could just see, it actually shows them Jesus, the picture of God's saving power on every single page. I mean, they'd be able to recognize Jesus in front of them doing these things if they could only see. But they've taken Scripture's revelation of God and brought it alongside a deep focus on them, a deep focus on human obedience, on their obedience, on the obedience of other people on a kind of bookkeeping understanding of God's law, of God's Torah, and to such a degree that it has blinded them to God and Jesus. Because if, like Pharisees, you make the Christian faith about what Jesus did and what we do, about God's faith and our obedience, about hearing the gospel and following the law, it will inevitably, not that those things are bad, but if you do those things, if you put them in parity, it will inevitably and very quickly become only about that other thing. I mean, just think about it. If it's not all about God's grace, if it's not all about Jesus, if it's even one trillion billionth part about you and what you do, well then, really, at the end of the day, it's ultimately all up to you. Because you're the only deciding factor in the equation at this point. You're the big question mark that's left on the table. Jesus has done his part perfectly. So really now, it all comes down to you and your obedience. And if that's true, you're probably screwed. I know I am. <laughs> but the Pharisees don't realize that. They don't realize what the law was really meant to do, what all scripture is meant to do, namely to point you to that door that Jesus is talking about, to point you to Jesus himself. They don't realize that the law was never chiefly about human obedience, but rather about human failure, right? And thus the need for Jesus. Because that's the point of it all. 
all human things, all our strivings, all our attempts at obedience, all our brilliant ideas, all our utopias, all our political systems, every single human thing there is, every other and we might be tempted to place alongside Jesus as something of ultimate worth falls short and ultimately, inevitably fails because of the one thing all those things have in common, namely us. And so instead of listening, to the all too human thieves and robbers who scramble over the wall of the pasture to ultimately, as Jesus puts it in verse 10, to steal and kill and destroy. And trust me, anything human, however good, will steal and kill and destroy if it is held up in your life, in your values, in what you treasure alongside Jesus. Instead of listening to them, we listen to the voice of Jesus here when he tells us that he and he alone is the door to where and who we are meant to be. Psalm 95, the Venite, which many of us recite every single morning in the daily office, declares, For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would hear his voice, harden not your hearts. That is who we are, the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. And so that is my prayer this morning for each one of us that we would look honestly at the places and for those places where we are tempted to bring something else alongside or even close to Jesus. And then remind ourselves that the good news of this Easter season begins with the bad news that even our best was never ever going to be enough, but that God in Jesus Christ has found a way and that we would see in him, in Jesus and Jesus alone, the door to that way home, the door to our pasture with God. And so to him be all the glory forever and ever. Amen.